comfortably numb, one of the most iconic rock guitar solos of all time. What makes this solo so great? Well, it sounds great, so you're welcome. But that's not that helpful for a guitarist. So if you want to learn a solo and, and really take from it some goodies that you can use in your own playing, listen to the solo, learn it, observe what's going on there, what patterns do you see? That's like reverse engineering it, and then you can make it your own with practice. So what elements can we pick up from the solo and incorporate into our own playing? One thing to consider is that David Gilmour composes his solo. Every time he plays the solo live, it's the same solo. The philosophy being that the solo and the melodic statements that are in are as much a part of the composition as the lyrics or the chords in the chorus or the arrangement, you know, elements of the song that, that you wouldn't expect to change. Every time he plays it live, it is what you expect to hear because they're crafted to be perfect. Improv is not totally necessary for a rock guitar solo in the same way that you would be expected to improvise in jazz. Jazz guitarists are not playing the same solo every night. Another element heard here that is perhaps more synonymous with jazz guitar playing is chasing the chords. Again, there's a reason this sounds so perfect, that the notes sound so intentional, and that's that he is playing shapes, arpeggios, scales that you would that would spell out the underlying chord rather than just choosing a blues scale and blasting off target notes. What are they, and why are they important? If you like the sound of chasing chords, playing target notes will help you get there. Technically, any note related to the underlying chord that you intentionally resolve to or emphasize can be a target note. But observe the notes David Gilmore plays when the chord changes occur. They are very well thought out. In the opening of the solo, on the D chord, David Gilmore plays an F sharp. So a D chord would be D, F sharp, A. So the note he plays is the third in the D chord. D, F sharp, A, one, three, five. Later in the solo, over the G chord, David Gilmore hits E, resolving down to D. The G chord is G, B, D and E is the sixth in G. G, B, D is your triad. Three is a chord tone, and six is a non-chord tone. Simply put, this resonates with the listener in a way that you could say is more melodic than just blasting off. The note choices and phrases sound right because they are right. Phrasing, so we had composed solo, chasing chords, and third, phrasing. He has such great phrasing. You hear that a lot, right? Are there spaces in your solo? Or are you just playing continually and not allowing any spaces for your listener to absorb the melodic statements that you're making? Kind of like feel, it's hard to define, but you know it when you hear it. You know great feel when you hear it. You know great phrasing when you hear it. A phrase, interestingly, is determined as much by the space between the phrases as the phrase itself. So things to consider here would be on what beat is he starting? Is it a downbeat or upbeat? Is it a strong or a weak beat? On what beat is he ending? Is it a downbeat or an upbeat? How long is the phrase? Is it a measure? Is it half a measure? Is it two measures? Is it a series of eighth notes? Is it half notes? Is it syncopated? You know, what is the rhythm or the pattern in time? There's a lot that would determine phrasing or good phrasing to a degree. Unfortunately, it's like you have it or you don't. That's a bit of an overstatement, but it's hard to teach phrasing. Here's another element. He restates phrases. If you play an idea once, that's nice. But if you restate that idea, it becomes something more. It becomes recognizable. It becomes a motif, a melodic motif or a recurring theme in music. So A, B, A, C being probably the most common melodic motif. And you'll hear that a lot in like verse and chorus melodies because it just resonates so much with us as listeners. It's very pleasing to hear a statement, have like a secondary statement that is appropriate, and then hear again the first statement and you bookend this in a way. 
And there are often variations, like subtle variations. And then for your C phrase, A, B, A, C, you would take it somewhere else. It's effective and common in songwriting, and it's also effective when you're playing a guitar solo. You just might not think to do it, but it really resonates with audiences, and it's a great way to start your solos. There are other elements here that are more approachable than concepts like phrasing and chasing chords and composing solos, phrase motif. You know, there are other more actionable elements here like release bends, crunch bends, flow bends, big bends. Not just bends of a half step or a whole step, but bends of a third, a minor third. On their own, these things are not exactly soloing revelations, but sprinkle them throughout your solo and nuance. And the way he played that just it was just it spoke to me. I felt those notes. And think about this: if you were to take those elements out, if you were to take out string noise and harmonics and mutes before the bend or before the phrase, if you were to take those things out, you'd really you'd really notice it. If you totally own these nuanced elements, these little tasty goodies, and you can very easily incorporate those into your solos, your soloing does take on another dimension. He's also using a ton of effects. David Gilmore is known to have one of the more complicated guitar rigs, the more, more elaborate guitar amp pedal rack mount setups in the industry. Before you keyboard warriors start in with, um, actually, it's all in the hands? Yeah, okay, fine, great. That is true, to an, to an extent, that's true. We'll learn this solo, note for note, and then try playing it clean. I mean, you know, you know. So let's break this down. If you're going to talk about the guitar solo, you have to talk about the platform he has for the guitar solo, which is the chords. So it's in the key B minor, establishes B minor right in the intro. Two bars of B minor before the verse enters, and we play B minor again. Goes down to A, goes down to G, and the bass passes by F sharp, but it doesn't really spell out the chord, to E minor and then back to B. So notice how it bookends here. One minor, flat seven, flat six, four minor, and back to one. So that happens three times. And then the chorus. So the first eight bars of the chorus happens twice. The chorus technically modulates to D major. B minor and D major are relative, so it's kind of hard to tell, but since there's no B minor played for about a minute and a half, it's pretty solidly establishing the tonic as D rather than B minor. So A is five, D is one, A is five. Doesn't really play B minor, doesn't really spell the chord, it's more of a bass playing the passing tone. Then C is flat seven, modal interchange chord from D mixolydian. G, chromatic approach from B back up to C again, G again. So in the key of D major, G is four, G is four, and C is non-diatonic, not in the key. The ending of the chorus is A, C, G, and back home to D. Five, flat seven, four, one. Again, the chorus starts and ends in D, much like the verse starts and ends in B minor. Then DS brings you back to the verse. And our solo, solo number one, is over the chorus with no repeats. So it's an 11 bar phrase. The first solo, David Gilmore is improvising over the chorus. In the second solo, he's improvising over the verse. Notice how it feels when that chorus hits and that song like blooms. The effect that has on you. you know, it's more than just the harmonic analysis. So what's going on there, what makes it so uplifting is that it's hitting the relative major. So it's the first time in the song that we step away from this descending. Da, 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 da. It's the first time that you go higher than the first chord. It's the first time you have a, a movement up and it's going to a major chord. And the orchestration of everything behind you is filling in and dynamically it erupts. It 
well, it doesn't erupt. It doesn't like pop off. It just kind of like blooms in, in my mind. You know, think about how that hits you. 64 beats per minute, very slow, but we're going to write this at 128 beats per minute, so the rhythms are easier to read. So we start in D, we're in the key of D major, 4-4. Four, four. We're going to write this an octave higher so that you don't have to read the ledger lines. Starts with a couple mutes, F sharp, tied, mutes, then F sharp bends up to G. Ties over the bar line, release, bend down to F sharp again. D bends up to E, carries over to the next measure, and the chord changes to A. And that E carries over to A. So the D is one chord in the key of D. F sharp is the third in D. The third bends up to four, releases back down to third, and the target note five on the A chord. So he's really thinking that 4 bends up to 5 on the A, and A is the 5 chord. We release the bend to D, first of many quarter note triplets, C sharp, A, E, second inversion triad, ties over the bar line again, lots of ties over the bar line in the solo, chord changes back to D, and he hits target note D, or 1. Over ties, more saucy mutes, saucy, saucy mutes. Bend from F sharp up to G, release bend back to F sharp. So D is the one chord, and he hits the root or scale degree one on that chord. So on A, release bend down to four, down to three, three, one, five, second inversion triad. And this is really the root before the chord changes. Then we have three, bends up to four, release bend to three. The chord changes to A, and he bends from D up to E, again, holds over the bar line. Chord and note triplet. A, E, D, C sharp, B, A. Descending, descending, and the chord changes to C. So, four bends up to five. Four, three, one, five, four, three, two, one. Notice the descending line. Now, C is not diatonic to D. C would be modal interchange from D mixolydian, flat seven. E bends way up to G, minor third, ties over to the next measure. G, F, E, D, mute, F sharp, G. So, three bends up to five, sharp four, three, two, sharp four to three, you could say, but the chord is changing and he's thinking about the upcoming chord, which is G. G is the four chord in the key of D. So he's really thinking 7, 6, and he lands on target note 6 on the G. Releases to 5, so a little tension resolution there. Quarter note rest, E, D, B, D. E, F, tied over. So E is 6 on G, releases to 5. Six, five, three, five, six, seven, and then he's thinking about the chord changing back. G is four, chord changes back to C. And that note, that F sharp hangs over and he bends that up to G. Mutes, 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 mutes abound. G, F sharp, E, D, B, G. Descending, descending, descending quarter note triplets. So the chord changes to C, non-diatonic, flat seven, and he hits sharp four up to five. So this F sharp is really leading into the next measure. Five, sharp four, three, two, seven, five. Notice he does not hit the root there. Sharp four, five is very bluesy flavor on this. He hits D, D, 
on the G chord. C. Natural. B. C. Natural. B. A. Five, four, three, four, three. And this would be two, but he's really thinking about the upcoming chord of A. Chord changes to A and he hits A. A, F sharpens up to G and he hits target note five on the C chord. A is the root of A. He hits target note five on the C chord, sharp four up to five again. E bends up to F sharp, ties over, E bends up to F sharp again, and then he releases that bend to E. Chord changes to G, hits D on the G chord over the bar line, slides up to B, slides down to A. F sharp is four, four, back to three, target note five on the G chord, three, two, to D. Target note five on the D chord, and he slides down. D is scale degree five. And these are the chords. Good stuff. So how do we practice these elements so that we can incorporate them into our own playing? The first one was composing solos. Just go for it. Whether you notate this or not is secondary to sitting there with, with the chord progression, really thinking out what you want to do, where you want to start, where you want to end. Some things to consider would be are you starting at a low dynamic and easing into it, and there's like a middle, beginning, middle, end, and you end on a high point, crescendo, volcano, whatever you want to call it? Or do you start low, build high point, and then bring them back home again? Maybe reference the melody in the beginning. What is the arc of it? Is it or is it Either way, they're different flavors. Neither one is better or worse. I would suggest against writing it as you come up with the ideas because we have a tendency to just once we put it down that's kind of it once we write it down we're somewhat married to what's written down we're perhaps less likely to make changes if um if it's already notated it's like well there it is how to chase chords there are plenty of ways to do this just to get to the point depends where you're coming from but learn your triads learn your triads across the string sets <laughs> see how they invert well by doing that and then warn them along string set dgb is kind of the sweet spot if you learn every inversion along and across it's a lot of information so it's better to do one or two of these well all of this is available for free on guitar Malade. on the youtube channel we have just a g to c map it's four bars of g four bars of c so you could chase the triads. to arrive at a, a command of the fretboard. We're playing what we're hearing in our mind without thinking about it. We're just in flow state. We're able to play anywhere on the neck that we want to. So 
Practice, 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 we'll let it all hang out. How do you practice restating? A good exercise would be just choose a key, choose a tonality or a scale, and just with a drone note, improvise A, B, A, C patterns. So if it's E Lydian, okay. of the drone is that you're hearing the note that you're playing against. You're hearing the note that gives you the context for the notes you're playing. Improvise basic phrases. One phrase, replay it in your mind. Another phrase, first phrase again, we're working on recalling that, maybe taking some liberties with it. And then fourth phrase, take it somewhere else. Phrasing. Now the good news is if you love the sound of a player with good phrasing, like David Gilmore or Jeff Beck, and you learn their stuff and you listen to them and you consume that, it should, if you're practicing, it should come out of you somewhat naturally. There are ways to practice it, but a good way to just make sure that it's in the ballpark of good phrasing is let there be space. Don't talk forever. Maybe be really intentional and say, okay, I'm, I'm only gonna play five notes for each phrase. All right, well, what are those going to be if you can only play five? How much time do you have to do this? You aren't going to like go through every possible permutation of like chasing chords, starting, ending notes, target notes that are chord tones versus non-chord tones, exploring every downbeat and upbeat. I mean, that's like a lot of practice, and I don't know if that's even necessary, really. You have to see where you are and see where you want to be and this is a video on YouTube. I can't, I can't tell you. I don't, I'm not. I don't know what you sound like. Effects. Similar to phrasing, emulate what you like. If you know you like the sound of comfortably numb being somewhat overdriven with some delay and reverb and modulation on there, try and emulate that. For this video, I downloaded a preset from, from someone on YouTube. Try different things. Work with what you have in terms of pedals. Try friends' pedals. Ask people in terms of the general way of, of setting things up. Where should your delay be placed in your signal? But don't be too, too rigid about that. Rules are meant to be broken, and a lot of the most exciting and, and meaningful moments in, in music and in art are people breaking the rules. Jimi Hendrix pushing his Marshall Plexi to the point that it's blowing up. I mean, signal actually distorting because it's being overdriven and heating up and breaking down. Just keep in mind, like a lot of the best stuff is people saying, yeah, I know this is what everyone's doing, but what if I do this? Hmm. That's a very valuable question to ask yourself. Other players who would use effects in a non-traditional way would be like Trey Anastasio from Fish, putting his compressor after his distortion. It's a very unique tone. Similarly, in a lot of electronic music and dance music, they're using a compressor to make the song pump. I mean, a compressor is was historically just to keep everything reasonable, right? To keep everything playing nice, nice. And now they're like abusing the compressor and making it do this. Notice how that feels. I mean, it sounds awesome. And if they weren't doing that, it would lose so much, that kind of music would lose so much of its impact. What else? Think about feedback as an effect and think about Hendrix playing the, the national anthem. I mean, if you had no feedback in that, what would it be like? Um, what else would be a good example of this? Um, a flanger, what is a flanger? Why is it called a flanger? Back in the days of reel-to-reel -reel recording, they would put their hand on the flange and apply pressure and release pressure, thus speeding up, or rather slowing down and speeding up the uh, the tape and getting this sort of flangey weird effect. So I don't have a lot of patience. I understand it, but I don't have a lot of patience for the rigidity when it comes to, to music and art. But if it sounds good, it's good, dog. If you have questions, 
about anything that we've covered in this video, please let me know in the comments section. And if you found this valuable, like, share, subscribe, and I will see you next time.